Hello, I'm Mike Degani with Nipissing University. I'm about to introduce a video that George Erasmus and I recorded that reflects on 20 years since the report of the Royal Commission on Aboriginal People. George Erasmus was co-chair of RCAP, as we refer to it, and I think what he shows in this interview is uh, a sense that the recommendations of RCAP, now 20 years on, are still relevant to today and have a lot to teach us about the future. So enjoy this video. Uh, I think it will uh, be both instructive on a, on a policy side, a political side, and give us a sense of where we're going with truth and reconciliation. Thank you. I want to thank you very much for being a part of this interview. Uh, there's a great deal of interest, great deal of interest in the Royal Commission on Aboriginal People, um, especially in light of uh, all the positive and hopeful uh, signs and sentiments that we're receiving about uh, Aboriginal people in Canada today. So I, I thought I'd just start with a bit of history and thinking about the environment that you were in when, when the Commission started with, uh, with, with you as co-chair. Um, so the Commission was initiated shortly after the Oka crisis. So what was, in the, what was the mood in Canada at the time and how would you contrast that with the sort of receptivity that we're seeing now? Well, um, remember that Oka was just one of many uh, incidents uh, where Aboriginal people were demonstrating for one reason or another, uh, where there were uh, people protesting, either protesting development or protesting things like, uh, you know, lands not being returned in Ontario after, it, you know, the war had, had taken parts of the reserve to, to use for, you know, shooting practices or whatever. Um, so the Oka incident was interesting because we um, we didn't regard it as anything special when it happened. It was just one of many where, you know, in this case, um, a community was going to allow, uh, you know, a Mohawk uh, gravesite to be used for a golf course, an expansion to an existing golf course. So it was no different, you know, than uh, in northern Alberta, you know, uh, some uh, community there wanting, uh, you know, their land to be recognized, you know, after decades of, of not being recognized. And so it was, it was, nothing, it was nothing really uh, new in it. Uh, the, the, the thing that happened, of course, was in, when the police came in and there was exchange of fire and then all of a sudden, you know, we have uh, an SQ that is uh, shot and killed eventually. And, and so they, then all of a sudden we have a major incident on our hands. But we had had demonstrations everywhere. And as a national chief, uh, uh, one of the things that we had had demonstrations on the Hill uh, was for Aboriginal languages uh, and also for funding for uh, post-secondary education. Particularly the post-secondary education issue was uh, one where, you know, we were, uh, we had some real, real problems with that, and we had uh, demonstrations going across the country on it. And then finally, some students from Northern Ontario decided to go on a, on a hunger strike. Um, and we, if, after a number of days, we brought them to Ottawa, in, right to the uh, Assembly First Nation offices. And, you know, we were counting down the days and the press would come in, you know, another day and what's happened with the policy and, you know, and, and I couldn't believe how long these students uh, fasted and we would be demonstrating every day on the hill. And so the, uh, the, the point was that um, OCA was unusual and it, it created national attention because, you know, the RCMP are there, the army comes in and all that kind of stuff and every day we have this national coverage. Um, but in reality, it was just one of many situations like that. So when you think about, here we are 20 years later, and you think about the Royal Commission and some of the specifics in the, in the chapters that, 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 you, that, you, uh, that the Commission created, um, are there things in there that you can think of that were, have been fully achieved, things that you recommended that have been fully achieved, and do you think there's a few things that uh, have... Uh, have really never started to be implemented. So maybe think about the things that were, have, been, have been fully achieved in the last 20 years that you're particularly pleased about. Well, uh, there, there are numerous areas of the uh, report 
the government has looked at and done something about uh, because, of course, we covered the whole waterfront. Uh, you know, there's virtually nothing left out. At the time, uh, it was kind of ironic because I remember sitting with the Chief Justice that was outlining what should be in the Royal Commission. Uh, and we were just listing out all these things, right? So, you know, let's, let's deal with uh, Métis issues. Let's deal with on-reserve, off-reserve. Let's deal with land claims. Let's deal with self-government. You know, let's deal with Aboriginal title. You know, let's deal with women's issues. Let's deal with social issues. Obviously, you have to deal with the economic issues. You've got to deal with the land. You know, you've got to implement the treaties. You know, we just went on and on and on. Virtually nothing that we could think of was left out. So you have this big royal commission that's supposed to deal with everything, to deal with Indigenous people or Aboriginal people. So, so there's no way that a federal government or even a provincial territorial government can, uh, can attack any area that has anything to do with Aboriginal people that will not somehow we have written about in, in, uh, in the royal commission. So if you take a look at some of the things that um, have been implemented, obviously one of the biggest ones is the creation of the Aboriginal Healing Foundation, you know, and, and the, uh, the granting of over $500 million over a number of years uh, to assist uh, with the impacts of the Indian residential schools, you know, whether it was sexual abuse, physical abuse, or mental, you know, uh, emotional, etc. That, I think, is probably um, likely the biggest uh, thing that, that that government has done and the healing programs that were created in communities across Canada by indigenous people themselves uh, probably is the biggest impact. Um, unfortunately the healing was not done completely um, as you know we made the case uh, at the end of the Aboriginal Healing Foundation it took over a hundred years of these residential schools um, to have you know this major impact where, you know, a language was denied, you know, and you're taking uh, Aboriginal people with one worldview and then creating another one, you know, instilling, you know, this brainwashing and, and you know, things like mouths being washed out with soap or whatever if, if you're speaking your language. And, and so the impact generation after generation, like, uh, there were places in Canada where three and four uh, generations of one particular family, you know, were impacted. So obviously things like uh, child rearing and, and all the rest of it, the, the culture, the language, I mean, everything was, was impacted and, and worldview was impacted. So we have lost a tremendous amount from what we were as Aboriginal people pre-contact. The reality is that um, 18 years of healing, no matter how good it was, could not wipe that out. And particularly since we didn't have the resources um, as the Aboriginal Healing Foundation to go to all parts of Canada. You know, we, we were, we decided in the end to try and do reasonable jobs in the, in the communities we were in. So the point is, even though that is the biggest area that we've had good things happen, uh, beneficial things happen, still the work was not complete when, when that was done. Um, you look at uh, the comprehensive claims, the process that's underway that deals with land and governance now. Um, that's an impact from, from the, the Royal Commission, no doubt. I mean, originally, uh, we were just dealing with land, only land. And then eventually, uh, with uh, the push from, you know, Aboriginal community across Canada to deal with, you know, self-government also, and then the work of the, the, the Royal Commission impacted in, in this area. Finally. Uh, places like the Clincho up here um, started to negotiate both land and governance. And it, this was actually happening uh, while the, uh, you know, the, the Royal Commission was, was still uh, underway. And if you look at the uh, comprehensive claims uh, policy in relation to governance, you'll see that things like the kind of powers that, uh, you know, um, an Aboriginal or Indigenous nation should have, uh, the social powers, the land powers, and all the rest of it, the ability to own source fund, funding from government, all this rest of it. It's largely influenced by uh, the Royal Commission. And there's been some, some good stuff happen there. Uh, for instance, the 
alternatives to extinguishment, which was something that uh, people were so abhorrent uh, of um, across the, the country to extinguish your original rights. Everybody kept talking about we want the inherent right. We want we don't only want the right to govern ourselves. We want the right to exercise the jurisdiction our people had pre-contact that continues to exist. So if we come up with an education policy, it is our own source jurisdiction that is continuing right through to the people that were here pre-contact. They had the ability to self-govern. We have the ability to self-govern. They had the ability to self-determine. We have the ability to self -determine. And it's nothing you're giving us. It's nothing to, the Constitution is creating. It's not this contract that's creating it. You're recognizing pre-existing rights. And so uh, what was interesting was the RCAP recommended an alternative. And they created um, a partial recognition of Aboriginal title, self-government, this kind of stuff. And the Klincho up here, for instance, um, actually have that in there. But they have a release. If somebody challenges the, the, the agreement and actually wins in court and it's a land right, then that particular right actually is, is extinguished. Recently, two years ago, while I was negotiating uh, the Dutch O agreement up here, um, the, the federal government, the Harper government, consulted with, with peoples about improving the comprehensive claims. And one of the ones we jumped on was, look, clean up this extinguishment. Get, get rid of that back release that, that you have there. Let's just go with a, an untarnished, you know, um, no extinguishment uh, policy. And they actually decided to do it. And so um, I left the Dutch show about a year ago, and we actually had in there uh, a complete alternative to, to extinguishment that is a recognition that title existed before and the title they're gonna have is the regional title and the, the governance they're gonna have is, is the governance they had before. As good as all that is, <coughs> and the lands that they're gonna recognize up here are uh, large, um, unfortunately, the governance power um, for land is not recognized. So if you have surface lands only, what happens is either territorial or federal government, or provincial if you're talking south of 60, actually uh, make the rules on how land is gonna uh, be developed. Um, if you actually claimed subsurface, um, like the Clincho did, all of their lands of 39,000 square kilometers, surface and subsurface is owned by the Clincho. So they actually have control over their land, simply because they own it. Uh, the, the governance power for, for it <coughs> is actually limited. They, they still have to deal with government policy on it. But if you have surface only, you have, you have no controller. It's, it's, it's all uh, other governments that are doing it. So the, the Clincho have control over their lands. They have a veto over it. Nothing can happen in it without, without the, their go ahead. And they can develop policy and, and so forth on how it can evolve. Unfortunately, the actual clear governance power you would have, uh, like a province, um, is still you know, something that we're going to have to fight for uh, down the road. Other, other generations are going to have to fight for that. You know, we had some impact on uh, specific claims, not as much as we did in, in, in comprehensive claims. Things that uh, were near misses were things like the Colonial Accord. You know, the uh, Prime Minister um, uh, Martin and uh, National Chief Phil Fontaine did some wonderful work. The other national uh, Aboriginal organizations were involved. And for about 18 months, 20 months, you know, there was uh, these meetings that led up to the Kelowna uh, meeting. And they actually had all the provinces on side. The uh, unfortunate thing was the government fell right after that. I mean, it was an amazing waste of, of all this effort and the provinces were on side and it, it was just terrible. There's been a, a, a real impact from uh, the RCAP up on uh, court cases, some that have gone all the way to the Supreme Court. We have Delgamut, for instance, uh, where you know oil, oral history was was recognized, and we had been arguing that as a pe as Aboriginal peoples forever that you know that's how our history is passed down, and it was accepted. 
Obviously, one of the big things that uh, is a direct result of the RCAP report is the, the recent TRC, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Um, it was a specific recommendation in our report 20 years ago to deal with Indian residential schools. And the reason was, as I was saying earlier, we had these three hearings that were happening at the same time. There were seven commissioners. We broke up into three. Every one of the hearings had at least you know, two, and some had three. Um, so they would start like on, on Monday or something and end on Friday, and you know, we, we went, all went uh, into different places and, and all the rest of it. And everywhere we went, we'd started in the same way. We'd list out all of the things that are in the RCAP you know, ability to deal with. So it'd go Indian Act, you know, women's issues, children's issues, land, title, you know, court cases, self-government, Métis rights, you know, off-reserve. I mean, you know, we had listed all out, right? Indian residential schools, whatever. And um, so people would um, start to have their, you know, sheets of paper and all the rest of it where they'd start their submission. And inevitably, if somebody started talking about Indian residential schools, and it happened every time, there was never a hearing we had where somebody didn't start talking about Indian residential schools. It took over. It, uh, it, it became, you know, uh, the issue uh, that everybody wanted to talk to. Uh, somebody would come there, like, you know, with uh, they were a representative of a particular group. They had a document they were going to present on either land or education or whatever. And they'd say, you know, if what that other guy just said there about Indian residential schools, you know, I went to an Indian residential school, and here's what happened to me, right? You know, and so... We, did, we weren't doing anything to encourage it, in the least, because we had such a long list of things we needed to deal with. But it was very obvious to us. Uh, and we did research in it. We came up with, a, you know, we, we funded a book in it by, by our researchers and so forth. It was, it was obvious. It was unfinished work. It was obvious that people wanted an opportunity to talk about it, to explain what they wanted done by the country in relation to it. Uh, they wanted to tell the story of the impact of Indian residential schools, and it, it was something that covered virtually, you know, the whole country. So it was one of our recommendations that another commission deal with this. And so, you know, the TRC, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission that eventually uh, was created, was an implementation of, of that uh, particular uh, recommendation. And, you know, the apology that followed it by the Prime Minister and so forth uh, obviously directly is linked to, to the same thing. Uh, there are many other areas uh, that uh, the RCAP has influenced. For instance, you know, we came up with uh, research concepts. If you were going doing research in an Aboriginal community, we came up with a policy. You know, involve the community, have them see the research in the end have Aboriginal people involved in actually doing the research. One of the things I was really proud of um, was how many Aboriginal people we hired uh, to work uh, for the uh, Aboriginal, you know, uh, RCAP process because uh, we, for if, even researchers, we're talking about research here, and, and uh, you know, we, we hired these, these young people that were just, some of them were just out of university and stuff like this. And, you know, we knew they might have been the junior on a particular uh, piece of work, but we knew that what would happen was that they would get the experience necessary so that down the road, you know, they, they would be the lead of many of this work. Unfortunately, the big key issues we wanted done um, we're not done, right? We, we said that what should happen should be 20 years of funding, uh, of some serious, serious funding for infrastructure, for self-government, for the negotiations. Um, come up with, you know, these agreements that will have land and governance all across the country, but the social programs that were needed, the healing programs that were needed to deal with, you know, uh, the issues, whether they were social or economic or otherwise, that were uh, so obvious in the, in the Aboriginal community. And what we said was, it's going to be expensive, but the reality is if you just 
pick and choose and um, dilly dally and and um, you know in fact it's everything is just as usual as it's always been you know Indian Affairs gets a few more dollars every year this kind of stuff if you don't have a massive injection across the board the expenses at, uh, at the end are going to be far more and we said look uh, the majority of Aboriginal people you know are under 25 uh, and the reality is if you move in quickly now you can capture the next generation. You know, you, you can train them, you can give them the opportunities to, be, to get post-secondary education and, and, you know, and give them back a clear understanding of, of their own culture and their language and so that they, they feel comfortable in that and they become a citizen of the world and they can contribute to not only their own people but to Canada and, and to, the, to the world. Move now, don't wait. Uh, unfortunately, they didn't. Um, you know, the, the government of the day was uh, under uh, Kretchen, Prime Minister Kretchen, and I could tell when uh, you know the co-chair um, Rene Dussault and I were meeting with with him that he was he was he wasn't going to do anything. The main thing that happened was you know uh, him telling us stories about when he was a uh, Minister of Indian Affairs and how way back when. You know, there were Indian agents and uh, how little control there was by First Nation people uh, on reserves. And I thought, oh my Lord, I can't believe we're going to miss this wonderful opportunity for anything to happen. And sure enough, they had to do something. So they came out with this healing uh, funding, which we needed. <coughs> but it was only one of the things that needed to to uh, be implemented. And so, unfortunately, there are large, large major gaps that um, have not uh, been implemented. The fundamental core of the, of the, uh, the recommendations. But the reality is, it took a long time for us to get where we were, and, and you know, it, it took like 20 years for us to convince Canada to come up with a comprehensive claims policy properly that had both land and governance and all the rest of it. And so that was done by, you know, Aboriginal people themselves lobbying and working hard and getting support from Canadians across the country. So I suspect that uh, the reality is the things in the uh, RCAP report uh, can still be implemented. George, you know, you, that you make a, a great point there. The, well, many great points, but the, the, the notion here is that RCAP was a, a very much a, a discussion of uh, the conditions of Aboriginal people across the board. And at the same time, it was quite prescriptive. You know, there was legislation in it. There was uh, recommendations for very specific funding in, in, in very specific areas. Um, and it, it, there is a difference between what RCAP recommended uh, because it said what was, what was up and how to remedy uh, some of the problems. And there's a very, it was very different with respect to, let's say, the TRC now, which is a very effective call to action, but doesn't really say how to get to the next step. It says uh, we need to reform our systems, but really, uh, it doesn't tell us how to do that or make specific recommendations like RCAP did. So it's quite different. Do you think that there's a need, and this is a process question, a need for something, a, an institution or a process now that uh, will help us implement uh, some of the things that uh, have been undone or unleft or left behind by uh, RCAP or some of the things that our TRC said? For example, RCAP 2, let's just call it that. Is, there, is this a time for uh, governments and Aboriginal people to launch an, another look at, at what's left undone? Uh, no, I don't think we need another commission. I don't know that we needed uh, RCAP at the time um, <coughs> because there were so many other things that had come forth before. But I guess in the end, we brought it all together. Um, I think the recommendations, um, you know, by and large, um, are still very, very useful. 
Um, I go back every now and then, take a look at um, them for one reason or another. Uh, a few weeks ago, um, a um, parliamentary committee came through Yellowknife if you're looking at electoral reform. You know, uh, uh, for uh, the federal house. <clears throat> and I brought out uh, sections of the uh, RCAP that dealt with electoral reform in relation to our Aboriginal peoples. The possibilities of having, for instance, you know, so many seats uh, that are guaranteed um, like New Zealand, you know, and they've had it for over 100 years. They've had, in fact, for 150 years, I think, they've, they've had guaranteed seats there, right? I find, no matter where I go into the, uh, the, the, the report, I, f I find it's still relevant. Sure, it can be uh, uh, you know, looked at so that it may well be that some areas need to be uh, modified, but I think the core, you'll find that the core in each of the areas probably still are, are relevant. What's needed is uh, political will. Um, the same way in which you had, you know, uh, Paul Martin when he became prime minister, you know, he had been there for 10 years, for just about, um, over nine, I guess, uh, as the finance minister. Now, I would say that as a fi that finance minister with all those surpluses, you could have had influence on the PM of the day and said, look, come on. Let's do something, you know. I mean, we, we have to do more than, than... But unfortunately, he waited until he was prime minister. And he wasn't prime minister for very long. You know, I, I was looking at all those surpluses over and over and over, and here we were talking about how you could invest. That was the word, invest in the Aboriginal community when, you know, they're so young and we, you know, we can... You know, so we're 20 years down the road now, right? I mean, imagine if we would have had 20 years of solid investment. What, what we had said was that the costs are going to go up like this, and then around between year 10 and 12, they're actually going to start dipping because you're actually going to start getting some returns from, uh, from you know, less people being sick or less people not being able to be employed or whatever. You know, you, you, you're going to... St and then at the end of the period, we predicted around 20 years, but even if it was 25 years, so what? When you actually uh, came back to where that investment wasn't needed anymore, you were actually getting some surpluses at the other end, right? Um, so what happened, of course, was um, Paul Martin, as the Prime Minister of the day, had political will to, to, to act on this. But the problem is that the underlining problems that we said were there 20 years ago that need to be addressed so that you didn't have suicide are still there because they never did anything to, to deal with, with them. They're still there because they have been ignored. And so unless they implement RCAP, 20 years from now, we'll be saying the same thing all over again. And it'll just be more tragic than it is today. Well, George, it, it reminds me, of course, of the, the speech uh, that you made in 1992 at the uh, Canada 125, uh, where you were asked, uh, I think, an innocent question in a in a in a in a hearing at uh, in in Parliament, in uh, in, in Ottawa, and, and I think the question was asked of you, uh, what do you have to be, what do you have to celebrate, George, at uh, now that's Canada's 125, and in a remarkable speech, which uh, which I often listen to and, and play for classes here at Nipissing University. You ask, you pose that question, what do we really have to be thankful for? What do we have to celebrate? And it turns out that after 125 years of, of, of Canada's existence, Aboriginal people were in a bad spot 25 years ago. And you pose the question in there, um, where are we going to be in 10 years? And by extension, here we are 25 years later, where are we going to be in 25 years? Are we in a... Are, I think we're in a better spot, but do you see any particular rays of hope that came, maybe that came out of our cap? I always like to think that post-secondary education is the way forward for, for, for all our people, but um, do you have any thoughts on, how, on, on where the most hope lies? Well, obviously the most hope uh, lies in the continuing resistance and struggle of Aboriginal people, right? Uh, the um, fact is... Uh, <coughs> our people still strongly uh, are resisting, you know, the colonial, neo-colonial kind of things that, that are going on. 
And I think it, as people always have said, you know, it becomes a cliche, but the reality is young people, you know, if they don't pick up the mantle, you know, and, and carry the torch forward, it dies. And what we have seen is successful generations um, all uh, pick up the torch to advance, uh, you know, Aboriginal and treaty issues. And each generation does it in their own way. It won't necessarily be exactly what was done by previous generations. Um, but in the end, it's uh, usually um, a way to move uh, people forward. And um, I suspect that that is going to continue to happen. So whether government acts or not, I'm hopeful in the end um, that, you know, Aboriginal people are going to survive. The only problem I, th I find is that what a waste. What an amazing waste because why don't we invest in our own people? Why are we spending so much time worrying about bringing immigrants here when we have people here that we can work with, that we're here pre-contact, that can be the next generation of workers and, and advance things, you know, in, in, a, in a way in which uh, we can clean up this problem that we have between original people and everybody else. You know, we can get rid of this, um, you know, feeling amongst Canadians that are not Aboriginal people that there's something wrong. You know, I don't really like what we're doing with Aboriginal. You know, I don't even bring that issue to me because I don't even want to hear it. Like I'm tired of it. No. I mean, like you know, it's it's. Um, it's like a festering sore, and, and, and until uh, the wounds are healed, then we will never have a nation, a country, that f really feels comfortable with itself. You know, it's not good enough for people to come here and, and build a new life where they have the economic means and all of this to, to, to move forward, and live in a country where all these indigenous people are not sharing. Why? How come? Why don't they just go get a job and, you know? Well, we listed out all the reasons why and what the barriers were, and if they are not addressed, then it's just going to take longer, right? So it's, the problem is the waste. But in the long run, um, I think uh, we will survive, and uh, we will have an impact on, on this country. Um, and in the end, maybe that's the only way. Maybe, uh, maybe in the end, as I learned a long, long time ago in politics, you know, nobody gives you power. You take it. There's no other way to get it. And women, I think, learned that. Uh, you know, Aboriginal people, you know, colonized people around the world have learned that. And, and, you know, nobody gives you power. You take it. And so, unless our people, you know, uh, do it themselves, I think, in the end, it's going to take a long time. And I think that unless our people force government to implement the, the RCAP report, it'll continue to be piecemeal. And politicians will do what they need to do just to get elected again. One final comment on reconciliation. This is the... Uh, um, and, I, and I happen to think that in terms of the question that, that arises most is what is reconciliation and how do we ch achieve it, um, especially with all the call to action, the TRC, I happen to think that the Royal Commission on Aboriginal People provided the answers to those questions. What is reconciliation? And uh, you've said that, you know, a lot of what's in RCAP, if, if implemented, gets at the roots of the problem, uh, especially of all the symptoms that we're seeing today. So, George, what do you, where do you see us going with this quest for reconciliation? And um, uh, what, are, what do you think are some of our, ne our next steps? Well, I think the TRC dealt with, uh, you know, a number of good ways of dealing with, with that, where Canadians and Aboriginal people, Indigenous people need to come together and get to know each other and, you know, and, and work out um, uh, both an educational process um, of what happened to Aboriginal people and also on the Aboriginal side, we need, we need to hear the stories uh, from... Uh, from Canadians and you know uh, new Canadians and so forth because there's a lot that needs to happen there and so 
yes, we can have the kind of social process and all the rest of it that is really important, um, people to people. But unless the major um, you know, issues that were being dealt with in the RCAP, whether it's land or governance or social issues, or um, unless those things are dealt with, um, you know, the major healing that's required from, uh, you know, the Indian residential schools, the major healing that's required from things like the Indian Act, you know, keeping people, uh, you know, we weren't able to vote in this country until 1969, you know. Um, court cases uh, early on in, the, in, you know, in Canada that uh, defined our rights, we were not allowed to represent ourselves. We were considered like wards of the of the state, so it was like a child taking a, getting a lawyer, right? I mean, we we we, did, we had no rights. So, we have uh, Canadian law is based on fundamental decisions that were made in court cases that you know we're we're not part of. So there's there's all kinds of stuff that needs to be uh, dealt with in, in a way in which the healing is required. And so we deal with it in the uh, RCAP report. And so, 20 years, well. The reality is maybe we needed the 20 years for people to think about implementing it. And uh, now's the time to, to go forth. But again, uh, my feeling is um, true uh, reconciliation. It's not going to happen without the participation of Aboriginal people. And if we, you know, create the conditions one of the things I always noticed um, all through my work as a, you know, as a leader, whether it was the Denon Nation president or the national chief, uh, um, was the strong support we had in Canadian society. I mean, when OCA was happening, we were virtually um, in the Aboriginal Healing, uh, we were in the Assembly of First Nations offices just about night and day. And the phones were just ringing off the walls with people all across the country. Uh, calling us to tell us how much they supported us and they were just abhorrent of what the government was doing or what the police were doing and then when the army was moving in they just could not believe i mean like our our phones were jammed all the time uh and the support of it there were and you know so i've always said it's not because of canadian people that the rcap was never implemented it's never been that it's always been, we, they have never elected a political leader, party, that's prepared to be as generous as the Canadian people are and are willing to be in recognizing the rights of the original people. Obviously, you know, there needs to be balance. Obviously, there, there, there needs to be a place for everybody. Um, but Canadians feel uncomfortable. They feel uncomfortable. They may even feel ashamed that their original people are not flourishing. But I don't blame Canadians. I blame Canadian governments for that. <laughs>